All right, I'm extremely excited to be joined on today's episode of the Believe in LA Football podcast. A two-time BCS national champion, 13-time NFL veteran, Mr. Frosty Rucker. What's going on, man? Hey, man. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And what's up, LA? Yeah, man. Super stoked to have this conversation. Hopefully uh, have a lot more in the future. We'll get to uh, that more later, but excited to talk to you about your career, just being in the locker room, all the stuff you went through, and obviously now what your thoughts on this current USC program are and kind of what the future holds. So, um, but yeah, quit, thrilled to have you on. And uh, let's just start, let's go back in time. I know it's probably a number of years from now, but, you know, being a, a local kid going to Tustin High School, was USC always the dream or did you have other schools on your mind where you recruited heavily some other programs or was it always going to be a Trojan? Well, being uh, an Orange County kid, obviously USC is highlighted. Um, when I went to Tustin High, uh, there's a gentleman that came before me, Deshaun Foster, and he actually was Gatorade Player of the Year. Mm -hmm. He went to UCLA. So UCLA at that point was like above it just from, you know, experience and seeing him go and succeed and uh, that whole bit. But uh, I actually went to Colorado State to start with and then transferred home after my freshman year. So once I got on campus at SC, it was just a during the football game, football game, dad, dad, you know, two different, uh, those football games and they, they have the TVs going and, I, and I'm trying to understand what's going on there get ready for my own game. And it was just a dream come true once I got on campus and uh, made the most, the most of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I didn't actually realize you went to Colorado State before. I'm from Colorado originally. Um, yeah. but, uh, I'm from just south of Denver. Uh, Littleton is the, the city. Um, was it, uh, you're not feeling Fort Collins or was it just then once USC I came knocking? Well, it was just a, a better opportunity for me to go to USC. Um, oh, of course. <laughs> from Cali and, you know, experiencing that cold weather and, you know, going through some stuff. I was like, I just need to come home. And um, I actually took a recruiting trip to Oregon State and they were just coming off a Fiesta Bowl win. Dennis Erickson was their head coach. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to, on a recruiting trip there. I liked it. I liked the scenic views of everything. I liked the trees and, you know, Oregon. And my mom was on the phone like, nope, you're coming home. <laughs> and then uh, Ed Orgeron got on the phone, a.k.a. Coach O. Yeah. And, yeah, I had no choice then. I didn't even know the guy. And he, like, told me I was going to USC. So I, I, I signed on the dot line right when I got there. And the rest was history. Yeah. You know, I've heard stories of Coach O's recruiting. And so it's, it's uh, understandable why, yeah, you couldn't uh, – say no to that and obviously with the the home background and everything there so so you get to the program obviously and this is when it was in its powerhouse years you know all the stars you being one of them but obviously the matt liners the reggie bush uh mm -hmm. Pete carroll and you guys had that tremendous kind of four-year run what was that like playing for a program that not only was competing for national championships every year but just in the national spotlight i mean you guys were it was the sex appeal i mean it was usc trojan football it was hollywood it was everything there was you wanted it was basically the U 10 years later, kind of how the U was back in the early nineties. It was a dream come true. You know, I had a chance to, when I, like I said, when I transferred in to redshirt for a year and really get accustomed to what LA was all about. Obviously I'm an Orange County kid, so I haven't really frequent LA too much. I had no reason to. And watching uh, Carson win the Heisman and actually practicing versus him um, that whole first year as I redshirted with me and Lofa Tatupu, um, just seeing the environment and seeing the energy, the way it was swaying, um, I knew I made the right decision. And I was just waiting for my opportunity to get on the field. I had to wait that year out, but um, practicing versus, you know, Justin Fargus, Michael McKenzie, Carson Palmer, um, Jacob Rogers at tackle, we, we, Sutan McCullough at running back, Kareem Kelly, you know, it was just, it, I was in awe of the environment. Um, obviously being from Orange County, already knowing who these guys are, and then transferring in and being in the same locker room and meeting them and getting accustomed to the work ethic that Coach Carroll and his staff had us on, um, I knew I made the right decision. And once I finally got my opportunity, I made the most of it, you know, after yeah. a position change. You know, I started at linebacker, actually. Mm -hmm. And I made a position change to get on part of that wild bunch, too. That was uh, fronted by Omar Nazel, Kenechi Udezi, Mike Patterson, and Sean Cody. So I was just ready to put my hand in the dirt and help out and actually got thrown into the fire um, due to an injury by Omar Nazel and I never looked back. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm always curious, you know, as an athlete, you always 
think you're, you want to put yourself as the best. You're, you're always competing against yourself and that's how you kind of build yourself up and build your uh, level of uh, play and your competition is almost against yourself. Yeah. You know, I played high school ball and I always wonder, is there a moment when you say, okay, I'm good enough to not just compete against the guys, but be one of the best. You know, I'm, you can see me, I'm a five, seven white dude with a four, eight, 40. I never really had that moment where I was like, I think I'm good enough to go to the next level. Was there a moment in practice or was there a game moment where you're like, I'm good enough to play on this national championship team to start to lead this defense? Or was it kind of all accumulation kind of coming down to one thing? Well, I knew I was ready to take the next step when um, coach Carroll and coach O uh, asked me to change my position. And it was a humbling experience because, you know, you come out of high school and it's like, why well, came here to do this? And, you know, you got, you had an ego kind of, right? Oh, yeah. And when I humbled myself to take on the opportunity to be on the field um, and have the opportunity to join Raw Bunch too, that meant I was ready for it because it was a mature level that I had to get to. Not saying I was the maturest kid at 20 or how old, 19 years old. Yeah. But I was to the point where I wanted to play. I had just sat out two years because I transferred and it was my time. So there was nothing that was going to get in the way of me having that opportunity. And I had to get out of my own way. And that right there let me know I could do it after, like I said, a whole football season of practicing burst, uh, you know, running scout team versus Carson Palmer and him leading, you know, that, that offense that broke records and he went on to win the Heisman Trophy. I, I, I knew I was there. I knew I was in that environment. I was working out. Uh, feeling myself you know the confidence was growing as the season um got going obviously the guys I was practicing get retired because they're playing the games but um I was getting bigger stronger and faster and that's what it was all about and uh, my mental game caught up with it and I just knew once I got unleashed on the field um the way I play football slash how I carry myself on the football field and you know studying and stuff it was going to merge into something special and I took advantage of it. Absolutely, yeah. At your level of play, it's almost not the physicality because everyone's got the physical build and makeup. It's the mental side, as you mentioned. So uh, once you kind of harness that, you're able to progress into that. And, and speaking of that, obviously, 2002 or 2003 and 2004, USC wins national championship. It was, you know, 2003 was the, whatever you want to call it, the co-national championship. And then the yeah. outright, outright stomping Oklahoma in 2004. And in 2005, a lot of people, probably not many USC fans, but everyone not USC will call it the greatest college football game of all time, that loss to Vince Young and Texas. What, what was the emotions, and this is always a dumb question I think people ask, but, you know, it's always kind of fun to hear your thoughts at least, the emotions of going from two years being national champs to the heartbreak of losing at the Rose Bowl against Vince Young and that last second, you know, play. What was that kind of emotional roller? I know it's a full year apart, but. Well, I mean, we won a lot of games at uh, USC. And if you mm -hmm. fast forward now to the day and age, you see what's the biggest threat in the NFL and college football is a dual threat quarterback. Mm -hmm. And um, playing versus Vince Young humbled myself and I'm sure our coaches on their coaching career paths um, to learn how to adjust to something of a sort. You know, if you see Coach Carroll, here's Russell Wilson. They run a read option. that gives them a chance to run, throw it, and use all his athletic, athletic ability. And um, we had so many highs and while well, I was playing at USC that that one particular low um, was humbling yet needed it to go to the next chapter. Because, you know, just like when you're transforming from high school to college, so to say, you go from being uh, a little spud to the big dog on campus right back to the spud, big dog. And I needed that last game to humble me as I went to train to get my next job, which was at the Cincinnati Bengals. So now I was at the low, I was low on the totem pole again. Mm -hmm. So it just fast forwarded it for me and, you know, readjusted me and got my mentals right before I, um, I got to Cincinnati. So um, with all that being said, it was a great time. We made a great run at um, USC but it took an uh, incredible athlete, incredible playmaking, and a great team to beat us. And that's how that ended in 2005. Um, I'm okay with people calling it the greatest game, you know, because they continue to play the game. And yeah. even when they show me diving at Vince Young's legs, I bet a million people would die to be in that position, to be on that field in the greatest game ever. And um, 
for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by it, but I'm okay with it. Yeah. You know, it was a great game. I wish it would have had a, a different outcome. I'm sure you'd be the first to say that, but, but a great game and a, and a great career at USC. And then, you know, obviously going to the draft, you get drafted in the third round by the Bengals. This was what, 2006. What was the, the draft process like then? I know nowadays it's, it was even then, but st- now it's such a spectacle. It's almost bigger than, than the NFL season sometimes. I know the draft is almost bigger than even the Super Bowl. So how, in your mind, I know you, as a veteran, you know, just out of the league one year almost, um, so you're not involved in it, but you see rookies coming in and stuff. How, in your mind, has the process changed from 2006 to now fast forward 2020? Well, everything's so media-driven, right? Yeah. It was then, it was, it was a big deal on NFL Network, but now even more so with – people taking an account for them, their own self and posting videos and showing them training, you know, with their trainers being able to be vocal on what they went over. And, you know, it becomes this big show. And I just hope the guys don't lose focus on what the ultimate goal is. It's not just to, you know, lift weights and run. You got to be able to play football. Mm-hmm. But the process itself for the draft and whatnot, at the end of the day, it comes down to what you put on tape. So, you know, I got a chance to, coach in the NFLPA Collegiate Bowl this year, this past season, right before COVID hit. And um, I got a chance to um, talk and mentor some of these younger guys that are coming to the league. And I was explaining to them, you know, it might not have been the senior bowl they're at, but it's just another opportunity they got to put film on tape versus more competition. Yeah. And half the battle with football is your mental game understanding what's in front of you, what, you know, you, you see the big picture and all this, but there's these, these, not even obstacles, there's these blocks and, and situations that are going to occur and how you challenge yourself to view them uh, will get you through it. And once I had those early conversations before practice even started and let them know, um, I'm going to be completely, really honest with them. I only have a couple of days with you guys. And it's not going to be too much stuff. I'm telling you, no, just, I just want to further your career. Yeah. And give you an opportunity. And they played their asses off. Can I say that on your show? They played their asses off, and I think they got probably five sacks in the game. And, you know, two of the guys I know got free agent gigs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm happy. You know, that was my first time actually coaching. You know, I consider myself kind of like a player coach my later years in the league. But actually coaching, and the guys responded, and they played very well, and they used the techniques I asked. And, you know, for that, I was happy about it. You know, because they just, they were in tune with the process. They're receptive and, yeah, taking of your knowledge. And, you know, I was at the NFL PA Bowl. It was an awesome experience. Great game. Were you, I'm assuming, were you on Marvin Lewis's staff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the new line coach for Marvin Lewis's staff. And Marvin yeah. was the defensive coordinator. Jackie Slater was uh, the offensive line coach. So, it was it was a great thing to just be in company with these guys. Um, actually, yeah. I it back here. Let me show you guys. Oh, there we go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some Hall of Fame guys on here carnell lake was there yeah you know so it was a great opportunity for me you know fresh out of the league to um be involved with something like that and forever thankful for coach lewis obviously he drafted me in the league and then gave me my first coaching gig so that was yeah. cool. it was a cool event was there back in 2006 i'm trying to remember was there all these different bowl games back in 2006? i know this is more of kind of a newer east west trying game, the senior bowl there's, that- more. there's more now more? okay yeah. Was more now than there was. Um, I think they had the uh, a bowl game in Hawaii. There was the East West Shrine game. The Collegiate Bowl wasn't around when I was yeah. coming up um, in Senior Bowl. So there's a, there's a lot more that they got now. Just like bowl games and stuff, you know, the more corporate sponsors you get, the more opportunities. So you know, I, I, again, I was thankful to be in the opportunity. So I, that's why I was sharing with those guys. Take advantage of it. Yeah, it was a cool event. Yeah, we saw a lot. I think uh, what Deontay Evans was with in the running backs in that bowl game, I think, and he got yeah. drafted um, by one of your former coaches as well, So, which we'll get to soon. But uh, I'm curious, being a Cali kid, you mentioned you obviously went to Colorado for a little bit, but what was it like being a Cali kid then going to Cincinnati? You drafted by the Bengals. You mentioned the cold in Colorado. It gets cold in Cincy. Uh, cool. what, what was that like? It was completely contrast to what I thought. I thought it was a smaller place where we were going to have cheap flights to go and everyone was going to come watch me play. Carson was there. Mm. I didn't know it was one of Delta's main hubs and the most expensive places to fly into. Of course. <laughs> yeah, so didn't know that. Um, the environment was different when I got there. It was an exciting time. 
Um, obviously, they had Chad Johnson slash Ocho Cinco. We had TJ Ushmanzada. We had Carson, but Carson was coming off his ACL surgery. So that whole dynamic was different. And um, the city itself, Cincinnati, is great. They've always been great to me. They embraced me. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate to get drafted there under – uh, like I said, Coach Lewis's um, guidance there. And I played six years there. So mm -hmm. uh, it helped me mature. And um, I'm grateful for that opportunity. I still do live back there. I split time in California and there. So um, I do like the the whole environment there. They have really good people. And um, it, it wasn't a bad gig. Yeah. No, it's amazing when you – there's certain places – I know I have this, that where you have a – you know, an interpretation or an idea of what it's like. And then you actually go and you live for a while or stay for a while and it really grows on you. Cause it, that's a place, Cincinnati is never a place I'd have any desire to visit or go. But then you go, I've been there and I'm like, this is a cool town, beautiful town. They got, they love their sports teams and they got a lot to do. So it's it funny good, how. It was a good, good eats. And like you yeah. said, you know, I, I felt the same way. Like, oh, well, it's a small town. I don't know where it is. And they had to look it up and stuff. But yeah. once I got there and really got accustomed to, you know, the people and, you know, I have some lifelong friends there. So um forever blessed to yeah. have the opportunity to play six years, uh, my first six years in the NFL there. So. Yeah, some great years too. So, um, you know, I'm curious, You was this just coincidence or was there some recruiting going on? You play with Carson Palmer in three different places, USC, Cincinnati, and then in Arizona. Did, did he recruit you at all or was it all just coincidence? Well, it's just how it all worked out. We actually <laughs> we were from Orange County. So I was a part yeah. of, you know, my high school. My high school played versus his in the championship when it was Carson Palmer at Santa Margarita versus Sean Foster at Tustin. So I was witness that. Mm -hmm. And so then I go into a locker room and he's there at USC and we go to Cincinnati. And then we finally really became, I would say, friends, like actual friends in Arizona because we're both mature, we're both older. When I got to Cincinnati, he was coming off his knee injury, just had twins. Mm -hmm. and I was coming in rocking and rolling from USC in a wholly, uh, completely different mindset, right? Totally. And so we all it, it kind of caught up with each other in Arizona, and we had some great years there, great five years. Yeah, no, some great years with uh, Bruce Aarons in Arizona. And so you played in your, I mean, not, not including high school, but you played for, I believe, five different coaches. What, Pete Carroll, Marvin Lewis, Pat Shermer, Bruce Arians, and then one year with, with John Gruden. Uh, put you on the spot. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but what, what's the coach that you most enjoyed, I guess, playing for? You don't have to say the best coach, or you can if you want, but who's the coach that you maybe still today um, say, man, that guy was a lot of fun to play for. I took so much from him, and he's one that really was instrumental in my entire football career and even life. Well, if you say instrumental, we're going to have to go back, so then I would have to say Pete Carroll. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation he set on, you know, how we went about our work, the energy, um, the hard work we actually put in. Uh, the ability to be put in different scenarios and still stay focused. Um, he still carries the same uh, traits with Seattle, and you see how they perform. They perform at a high level week in, week out, and they're always in contention. So I would say him. Um, secondly, on um, experience-wise, I think I would say Bruce Arians because um, when I got to Arizona, I was – uh, going on my 30th um, birthday. So I was more mature than I was coming in the league. So that was a good thing. And, you know, he let, if you're a grown man, he let you be a grown man. He didn't really um, say too much to you um, in a bad way. He let you go about your business. And if you were on top of your stuff, he really didn't have anything to say and he just let you perform. So that, and then I would say instrumental wise, I would go with, Marvin Lewis and obviously Mike, my my defense coordinator was Mike Zimmer, which mm -hmm. is the now for the um, Minnesota Vikings. Vikings yeah. Did a great job um, coming in. He came in, I think, my second or third year, third maybe, and totally and turned our program around on the defensive side of the ball and um, gave me a, a lot of knowledge on down and distance and why you were playing certain plays. And my football knowledge grew. Um, from Mike Zimmer onto my defensive line coach, um, Jay Hayes, which is a great guy and great mentor I still talk to. And then um, I would say Gruden, and I'm not going to give him the lowest rating just because it was just one year. Mm -hmm. But he treated me, obviously, I was the one of the oldest people on the team. So 
Um, he treated me with uh, utmost respect and he let me work. And um, I played 15, started 15 out of 16 games. I played every game I played, I started and um, I worked for it. Um, he made me work for, I was, I was playing in preseason games and stuff I haven't done in seven years, you know, play, I played the first preseason game for the Raiders and I finished the game with a fumble recovery. And it was so humbling because I was 35, like looking around, like, what the hell am I doing in this game with all these kids yeah. at this moment? But, you know, they had a reason, a rhyme and a reason for it. And um, I just trusted the process and I ended up playing a lot of snaps that year. So um, that's how I would grade them just off, you know, I was longer. Yeah, for sure. And people and stuff. But all great coaches. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I had Coach O, I had Jay Hayes, I had Brinson Buckner as D-line coaches. They shaped me. They, they really got to know me and understand me, how to make me tick, how to turn the light on, turn it off. And um, I'm grateful for those guys. I still talk to all of them. So Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I just thought this right now, so I could be wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong. But when you were in Oakland, was that the year they were on Hard Knocks? No, they were just on Hard Knocks this past year. Okay, as the past year. Cool. Yeah, I mean, Thanks, get I've been on Hard Knocks with the, the Bengals before. So, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so there, there's some TV time there. And then we did all or nothing when I was in uh, – Arizona. Arizona. That's right. Which did you, could you notice a big difference between the two? Like, or is it, it's just cameras in your face so you can't tell the Yeah, you're you. just going because they got cameras, um, like GoPros all over the place and weight room, anywhere. Yeah. So you just keep going. Sometimes there's camera crews and they follow you around. But I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. So it wasn't really a big deal. You know, I hate to say it like that. Like I'm patting myself on the back for being really cool. <laughs> you can do that. You can do that. You know, being the coolest guy out there. No, but yeah. seriously, it was just, it's a way of life. And yeah, you know, just go about your business. You're professional. And that's part of it. Cameras in your face. Exactly. So, yeah. I, I'm excited to see this year with both Rams and Chargers. We get both LA teams right here in our, our backyard. If they play. Yeah, I know. And it'll be interesting because they won't be able to leave the facility. It'll be like camera crews quarantined, but whatever we'll see we'll, yeah, so we'll see people go go completely uh crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so we'll, see, we'll yeah. see more antonio brown moments i think maybe a lot of uh player blow-ups maybe i hope, I, <laughs> I hope and then i hope that he's changed too i did too i did too we'll see if he gets back in the league but uh bruce arian's got to be the biggest best swag though of all your coaches right yeah he's swag yeah he is, uh, uh, so, uh, um, amount of swag to him with his kango hats and his get up and He's as cool as a fan, Uncle Bruce, as we call him. That's cool. Yeah, seems like an awesome dude. So, uh, you know, before we talk a little bit, just current USC, I'm, uh, I was kind of thinking before we got on and, you know, all these great players, and I mean this with all respect because you were one of the great players of this USC program, but, you know, you got Matt Liner, Reggie Bush, all these great – Brian Cushing, all these great guys, and you outlasted all of them in the NFL in your 13-year career. What do you think you did different to outlast all these, I guess, if you want to say bigger name guys – um, and you're the one in the trenches. You're knocking heads every single play, uh, you know, b battering guys. And, and how were you able to just keep your body healthy and outlast everyone for 13 years? You know, it's a good question. Obviously, um, uh, I'm, I, th I think I have a whole bunch of people that pray for me. And I'll say that first. Uh, so I'm very thankful in that manner. I got a lot of people that support me. And um, I think it's just I, l I learned how to train for what I had to do. I think – a lot of people, they, they had high, great, great careers that, you know, big name guys and stuff. My body didn't break down um, the way theirs did. And, you know, I could continue to play. I think the miles they put on earlier in their career, as for when I started off in Cincinnati, I didn't play as much. Um, I had injuries and whatnot, so it kept me off the field, but I didn't get all that wear and tear on other parts of my body. Um, I learned how to train to be in the trenches to do my job. Um, I knew what I needed to do, and I didn't overdo the stuff. You know, a lot of people are still putting 600-pound squats, and, you know, that looks cool, and, you know, it's effective in certain situations of the game, but not all the time. Yeah. And then back locks up on you all the time, and, you know, and, and your shoulders and, you know, things like that. I didn't have those those type of injuries. So, um, I just think I was blessed, and the way I put f play football, I, I just mastered my craft, and 
and it's mind over matter too. You know, a lot of guys, not even the guys we're talking about that went to USC, but a lot of guys in my field, um, they can continue to play, but ego gets in the way of like how much money they can make and stuff. And I was always about just the opportunity to play. Mm -hmm. You know, my whole focus and goal since I was seven years old to play in the NFL. So, you know, I hate to tell the GM this now, but any dollar amount that you give a guy that's really about that, he's going to play for it because he wants to continue to play professional sports. Totally. So for me, it was, I didn't have an ego when it came to contracts and things like that. I didn't really uh, sit out and stuff. You know, I just knew when I got a part of good teams, I needed to be on that good team. And I knew I was a solid piece to that good team. Yeah. So um, what I sacrifice dollar amount then i'm pretty sure i'll get it on the back end in some some shape or form yeah so it's okay i got 13 years in i played as hard as i could um i'm very happy with the way it ended even we didn't win a lot of games in oakland but you know being a being coached by john gruden like you said you know him his first year coming back out of retirement and being on tv to you know be able to once know him as a coach, watch my NFL films, mm -hmm. watch him in the booth, and then he's my coach. And he's giving me my 13th season to come back to California and actually play. So yeah. it was all good. I'm, I'm, I'm completely content with how it all shaped out. And I think I was just favored in a lot of ways. I busted my tail and stayed driven. Yeah, man, you had a you had a great career. And I'm not just saying this, but it was I was so blessed and honored to have you come on the show and be able to talk to you. And I followed your career a lot. And I, I you know, a, guy, a name like Frosty Rucker is hard not to follow that guy around the NFL. So, so yeah, I loved it. So, uh, but you know, looking now currently at the USC team, let's talk a little bit of that. Your alma mater and and something we'll talk about. And you're doing a USC show on this network too, so you'll be getting to that a lot, I'm sure. Um, let's start at the top. So Lynn Swan resigns, kind of uh, from a fans perspective maybe very unexpectedly I don't know on the inside if it was unexpected so let's start with that when you saw that news were you surprised did you think it was coming I know there's a lot of kind of turmoil going on in the inner ranks or what would you think of just the Lynn Swan move for me I was very happy with the hire of Lynn Swan because as an athlete I do have envisioned one day of being the athletic director or mm -hmm. G so that's kind of I was happy to see that um, the way everything uh, transpired while his time there we didn't get any better and um, that's just me as a fan, as an ex-player, we didn't get any better. And I think the, the AD's job is to put everyone in position to win. The whole thing blew up. Um, this, then we had um, Hayden. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, we didn't get any better. Things start getting built around campus, and the campus looks amazing and whatnot. But our football club didn't get any better. And now we have Mike Bone, and I feel like this offseason with Mike Bone, we've gotten drastically better. I think yeah. he put a real focus on our program, not only just getting us uh, – it's not about just getting iPads and all these fancy things. It's about getting guys that want to be Trojans, coaches that want to be Trojans, and putting it together. And I feel like we finally are going to – dig ourselves out of this hole that we've on and off the record have put ourselves in mm -hmm. as a university. I feel like we've gotten better. We've gotten better coaches. Um, and we look at our recruiting classes coming up. I think uh, we're headed in the right direction. And I think with COVID happening, we're actually kind of equal to a lot of people because um, they didn't get the experience of spring football and all these situations either. So I think, um, in our own way, we're, we're growing as a team. It, it may sound odd, but I feel like we've gotten a lot better during COVID. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I, I love the Mike Bone hire. I mean, you see what he did at Cincinnati. That's not a perennial powerhouse program, and yet they were, what, four straight years of winning, uh, guys getting drafted. Um, so I think what he's able to do now with the resources here at USC will be great. And, and you mentioned Pat Hayden, and I think what kind of in a way depending how you are as a fan but kind of what dug his grave was his decision to let coach O go where he ended up obviously at LSU now in a national championship and retain Clay Helton as his head coach so that brings me to this I mean what's your thoughts on Clay Helton obviously Mike Bone had the same opportunity to go after someone bigger I mean we don't have to talk about him but obviously the the coaching spectacle that we saw all during the season we decided to stay true to Clay Helton um, do you like that decision do you like Clay, Clay Helton as the coach of this program for the future 
Yeah, I think right now it was about, look, we, 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 we missed big on Coach O. He was already there. He was a hell of a recruiter, but those kids loved Coach O. Mm-hmm. And we missed big on him. He just didn't fit the, I don't know if it was the look or the talk of being the head coach at USC. And for that reason, look at what he's done. But for, for Coach Helton, um, you know, you got to remember these kids stood on the table and wanted Coach Helton to be the coach. There's a lot of them that went up there to the AD's office and said, we want to keep this guy. And um, that speaks volumes for the type of person he is, not just a sports fan and grading USC just off championships. We're talking about how he is to these kids because they all also won't be at USC for long and how they mature into society. So if these kids, you know, loved him enough to go up there and stand up for him, that gave him a few more years. Um, also, with that being saying, um, Coach was uh, had to battle with all these sanctions and how to practice with these, uh, you know, not having enough players and, you know, all these other obstacles that he's had to go through. I think finally finding him some great assistant coaches. Mm-hmm. Not saying the guys we had here in the past were bad, but statistically, when you're looking at special teams and the defense side of the ball, weren't very good. So going out and getting new coaches, getting a recruiter. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that helps him around. He was already winning seven to eight games anyways, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. At least the meters up here. You, it's, it's, it's either championship in this playoffs or you didn't accomplish anything. So these certain moves that I think we made made us better, but we have to grow. So do I see this as a long play? Maybe not. Maybe Coach uh, Helton has other plans and aspirations that he wants to do outside of SC football one day. But right now, I think it was good to – keep the base that we have for at least another year. Yeah. And like you said, look at who our assistant coaches are. Um, Graham Harrell, right? Yeah. He may be a head coach one day. He got well, offered to be one, right? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that this coaching situation has to be the same for the next five years. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I've said on this show a tons, tons of times, and it's all just my own opinion, but I, I fully kind of believe that they love Graham Harrell enough that they were even keeping Clay Helton just to, so that they wouldn't lose – Graham Harrell so they could groom him and eventually have him take over maybe the head coaching job because he'll be highly sought after in another year or two I'm sure exactly and that's the same thing and one of the things I know I know we got taught around before our, uh, DC I really wanted Chris Richard mm-hmm. um, I really wanted because I see him as a potential guy that can also be a head coach and totally. if we have those two guys well now we have Graham, regardless of the, it may be Orlando one day that maybe who knows but if we have this level of coaching that's there we can groom someone to be the guy. So drastically firing Coach Helton when we do know all the stuff that was put ahead of or in front of him, the things he had to go through. I think, you know, if it is just one more season, I think with his supporting cast, it will be a lot better of a season. Yeah. When we look at the 2021 recruiting class, who right now is, I think, ranked second in the nation or something, and they still keep adding guys. Like, he's exactly. getting back to what he was, why he was given the job in the first place. He was known as a good recruiter, and then uh, now he's been able to kind of get back to doing that. And I think the future is bright, like you said. So you mentioned Todd Orlando. You're a defensive guy. Guy comes from Texas. Kind of had a good couple years, and the Texas defense has kind of fallen off. But what did you think of his hire? You mentioned Christian Shard. His name was thrown in the ring even as a – potential head coach then obviously Washington retained him once Chris Peterson stepped down so what did you think of the Orlando hire um I don't think it was a bad one um it wasn't just a a fancy name or whatnot but he came from another uh prominent uh college and given the talent if it works out it does again I believe COVID's the biggest blessing in disguise because all the coaches all the players we have real enough time to really understand the playbook yeah. And really going, if there's any situations or questions you have, there's more than enough time to get an answer. Yeah, you don't get the valuable reps on the field, which are huge. I, I would say the reps on the field are, are, are better than just watching game film because you practice more than you actually play the game, right? But learning it, being able to read your X and the nose and knowing what the guy right next to you is doing as well as yourself, this guy behind you, I think if – um, if they attack the offseason like they did by getting all these coaches and they attacked it the same way on these Zoom calls and whatnot and going over each play and coaches can meet anytime they want with players probably on Zoom, there, I don't think there's any questions to be had. And I think that's where our advantage was for this offseason that COVID actually happened and gave us enough time to dive in depth with our actual playbook. 
Yeah. Well, and you get, and this kind of goes for every college program, but you know, when you're an athlete, you sometimes, especially if you've played for so many years, and I know these college kids are so young, but they've played probably, you know, junior high, high school, and now going into multiple years, you sometimes almost take it for granted. You know, your football is a year round sport. You're practicing, you're in the weight room, you're doing all this. All of a sudden now it's been since March where you can't be around your teammates, you're not in practice and it almost kind of makes you hungrier and just ready to get back on the field, back on the gridiron, doing what you love. And so it'll, it'll you're diving deep in the playbook. You're almost maybe committing more time to it because you're not out with, you know, on campus chasing other stuff. You're, you're in the playbook. And then when you get to the field, it's like time to roll, time to, time to get this season right. Yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, being able to recite things, I don't know how these Zoom meetings are going, but I'm sure having a panel with guys and being asked questions and doing your homework and having homework to turn in with no one around you to be like, let me see your paper and just write it in. I think the educational level of football, which everyone wants to quote as students of the game, I think this is where it really comes in. So if they take advantage of this, it's going to be one of the best off seasons ever. Um, granted, like I said, we do need the reps on the actual field with new coaches, um, defense and, and special teams. But at the same time, if they're really taking heed to this opportunity of really being students of the game, I think it's, it's a true blessing for us. Yeah, I agree. And, and the last thing I'll say, the one, the one bummer, and I talked about this last episode, is the fact that without those reps, we have to open the season against Alabama. That's kind of the one. The yeah. one I wish we opened against a, a small program just to kind of, you know, get the wheels turning, you know, get the reps in. But unfortunately, you got to open up against freaking Alabama. Yeah, and, and the, the issue with this is that each state is different. So, uh, you know, we phase into different situations. Another state could be completely, you yeah. know, go for it, practice. And, you know, Alabama, you know, their pockets are deep. They're probably under someone's barn somewhere practicing. You know, oh, yeah. we know what's going on, right? Oh, for sure. So that, that is a disadvantage, um, I think, in the slightest. But if they're not having the reps like we do, I think – they're going to have to give each team an allocated time to get it going. And, you know, the game may be a lot closer. Yeah. Hopefully. I'm not saying we're going to lose. I'm not saying we're going to win, but I said the game's going to be a lot closer. Which is fine. In my opinion, obviously you want to win every game, but a close game. It's confidence, right? If, if the game's closer, we know yeah. we can play with that type of a, 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 um, athlete with that attitude. I think that propels us the same way I'm saying we're, we're going this way. So. I agree. And we saw what two or three years ago when that blew it against Alabama and then Sam Darnold comes in, they turn around and end up having uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest college football games in the Rose bowl against Penn state when they could have been in contention for national titles. So uh, Frosty, this has been fun, man. Last thing for, you, I just thought of it right now, just cause we were talking college and, and advantages and whatnot. Uh, I, I can't remember how many States have passed it now. I know California's one, New York's one, but that whole rule now that college athletes can, can earn money off their likeness, you know, endorsement deals and, what do you think when you saw that? I'm sure you would have loved that back when, when you were in college, but what's your thoughts on that? Or are yeah, you against it? It's just the simple fact of loosening the grip on, you know, these guys that are performing for these universities, making them millions upon millions of dollars and can't even get a stake, you know, can't even yeah. afford to pay their phone bills, especially in a market like SC where you're in LA, the price of living is so much higher than other places. Um, I think it's about time. Everything has to progress at whatever level it does, and it has to get better. And I think it's right on cue with Reggie being able to come back, um, you know, him being reinstated in the university. I think it's a perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a perfect time. It's kind of, you know, a coincidence how <laughs> the rules change and he's able to come back at the same time. But for whatever reason, I'm glad it's like that. You know, um, these athletes do deserve something. They do deserve if, a coach can make eight, ten million dollars a year yeah. off, you know, their sweat, and they don't get anything. There's, there has to be a discussion on how these guys get something because not everyone goes pro. Putting money aside for, you know, when they're done, so they can, you know, get suits and get, you know, and properly train for jobs and whatnot. They have to have some type of fund because there is no insurance, right? There, yeah. For injuries and things like that, there, there has to be something. You got to stop taking advantage of it and. Uh, I like where the, the the progress is going with this. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, I don't know all the the legal jargon with it, but I I always thought it was it was going to be really tricky if universities or the NCAA was just going to straight up pay athletes because you you look at the athletics as a whole. But I love the fact that hey, if you're an athlete, a big name player, and Nike wants to come and and put you in a commercial, you can earn from that because I think that's that's what capitalism is, and that's 
everything the NCAA does is so anti like American capitalism. And so this finally is like, Hey, if you can earn the money, do it. Like let's, let's make it happen. Yeah. So it's all in reason and how they do it and how they structure it the right way, but everyone should benefit from this. And, um, like you said, you know, these kids can't be going out here being the big names and, you know, raising all this money for the university and not have anything to fall back on. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, so. Unfair, unjust, so. yeah. Uh, progress is so Frosty, man, this is fun. Frosty Rucker, uh, USC football champion, 13 time NFL player. Uh, you can find him on Twitter, the organic frost. Uh, what's the, you're launching this new podcast. What, when's it coming out and, and what's the name? Back the West podcast on the Believe Network. Um, it's going to be my, me, myself, uh, Will Poole, um, another guy that played at USC, had a, a phenomenal Rose Bowl game, got drafted to the Miami Dolphins. Um, he's going to be my uh, co-anchor, I would say that, because we're going to be anchoring this thing. And we're going to have a lot of good times. We're going to bring on many guests, and we're very fortunate to come out of USC. So look for us. We're going to be coming in. Um, tackling everything remember i said that in the text that we had but we're gonna have a good time and, and hopefully grow this thing into be the juggernaut that we know it can be yeah it's gonna be a great show i can't wait to listen to it so everyone out there for all your premium usc content make sure to check that out drop in here soon but frosty this was fun man i, I really appreciate you and I, I have a feeling we're gonna be doing this again soon yeah that's, that's what i hear too so let's just keep talking let's keep growing and let's be the best that we can be absolutely man appreciate you stay uh stay safe and stay healthy all right Likewise, take care.